Hello and welcome to another episode of the Iraqi Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, Juma Iraqi, and today I have with me Dr. Douglas Kalman. Doug, how are you today? Doing very well. I'm hoping that your day is going great as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, pro- it's actually going really well because today it's actually 29 degrees here in Norway and we don't get to see a lot of sun in this country. So always when it's so sunny in Norway, we always get really happy. We're not as lucky as you guys in Florida. So, Well, so- Florida is known as the sunshine state um, and uh, definitely we get a lot of sun. And I can tell you if you're ever living here or visiting and you could actually tell, I, I joke that there's two seasons in Florida, hot and hotter. Yeah. And, and, but you could tell, I say, oh, the sun has been turned on. Like you could tell when it's turned summertime, like the hotter portion, because it'll be 6 a.m., 80 something degrees outside. So 25, 30 degrees Celsius. And same thing at 11 p.m. at night. So yeah. it's an intense, uh, uh, but I love it. That's why I live here. Yeah, I envy the, the the weather you actually have in in Florida. One thing that we actually struggle with here in Norway is uh, is a lot of vitamin D deficiency, especially when people don't uh, eat the right foods. Because basically in Norway you have you have if you're lucky you have late May, June, July, and maybe the start of August to actually produce enough vitamin D, and the rest of the year you have to either take supplements or you have to be really uh, strict with what you're eating. So we're lucky that we have some, uh, we have a lot of uh, salmon here in Norway, but we're not so lucky when it comes to the sun. Well, so, you know, let's not underestimate. I know that's not the topic of the day. Yeah. But one of the, one of the projects I was working on recently was an analysis of, of vitamin D levels of um, NFL football players. Yeah, okay. And we were looking at uh, injury rates of one particular NFL team. We were looking at vitamin D levels of all of the players along with injury rates for all of the players for the season because vitamin D was tracked throughout the season, Mm -hmm. preseason into season. And interestingly enough, you know, while many of sports are played outside, so the, the, the American game of football, right, that's an outdoor game, but you play it wearing a heck of a lot of clothes and gear. Unlike um, um, football slash soccer, where you have a shirt and shorts, at least your arms and legs are exposed and your face yeah. to the sun. In American football, it is not. And it was interesting to me to find that most of the players, irrespective of their color, meaning Caucasian or or, 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 or or black or whatever, were low on vitamin D. However, those people that had lower levels than 30 had a higher incidence of joint injuries, bone injuries, and hamstring injuries. Yeah. And it was, and, and amazingly enough, that most of those injuries surrounded a vitamin D level of anywhere from 23 to 27, where we know in power sports, vitamin D levels around 80 to 100 correlate best with strength and power. Yeah. So it, even in America, even in the sunshine state, we sometimes have a problem with vitamin D because um, we're always told to protect ourselves from the sun. So people put on sunblock so they don't get cancer. Yeah. But then you're also blocking your body's ability to synthesize vitamin D, mm-hmm. um, and you know to turn on uh, to turn it on, so to speak. Yeah. And, and you know this is a, becoming probably a worldwide concern uh, uh, um, or worldwide interest about vitamin D and health. And it's definitely something that there's a lot of correlation with mood states, you know, depression, uh, maybe even seasonal affect disorder. Um, and, and things like that. So I know that's not the topic of the day, but I think that vitamin D is uh, is is one not to be laughed at or overlooked. Absolutely. You know, for health and if you're an athlete and if you're a power athlete, go get your vitamin D levels checked. And yeah. just because something comes in at a level of 35 and it's accepted as as normal by the lab, normal does not always mean optimal. Yeah. 
Exactly. Uh, uh, good thing that you mentioned that because uh, I also see some reports that uh, they see the same things in in um, in the Middle East, like for example in uh, the United States, uh, United uh, Arab Emirates. They have a lot of sun, but they have a big problem with vitamin D deficiency, and it's probably because one, it's so hot that people try to avoid going outside, and number two, the the clothing that they wear there. So I've seen, I've actually seen some levels people are down at 15, 14 sometime. So that's really, really low. So, uh, and I remember I used to work at a, a medical clinic two years ago, and I always screened uh, the patients for vitamin D deficiency. And I would say that approximately 60% of the clients that I had, uh, uh, of the patients that I had in were deficient in vitamin D because the system here in Norway is that from 50 to 150 is still the range that they want you in but they they are last couple of years they've said that optimally it should have should be at least 75 so even if you're under uh, 75 and it's still in the range it's probably not optimal it, it's interesting um there's a friend of mine who's a, a registered dietitian, and she's also a sports nutritionist that lives in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And so Alaska, you get plenty of sun, not really much heat, um, except for maybe August, September, you get some warmer months. But she has the athletes at the university walk around to teach them with a meter that you could put on your clothes that tells you how much vitamin D you're being exposed to at the moment. And so you could see, like, oh, you know that you need 20 minutes of exposure. Am I a minimum? Am I getting that kind of exposure? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all of these wearable technologies are are, cha are hopefully changing for the positive how we can impact people and their health. Yeah. And if it comes to sports nutrition, people integrate with you know their Fitbits, their polar heart rate monitors. They integrate, you know, on their on the internet so they can get feedback from their workout along with upload what they're eating so they can track, you know, um, um, their progress or lack of. Yeah. And, and um, the wearable technologies is really helping to change that. And when it comes to dietary supplements and sports nutrition, while they're not wearable, they're part of technology. Food yeah. is technology. If it wasn't, we wouldn't always have advancements in food. Yeah. You know, actually a whole field that you could get a, a, a PhD in food science. Yeah. That's technology. So I always joke that if a preservative is in a food and it can make that food last forever, well then heck it should help us live forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially when people are so afraid of a lot of preservatives. So and, uh, th there's a lot of myth myths there. There are a lot of myths, mm. and, and, and so we address one thing at a time, mm. and, and we address one concern at a time, and I think that what you do is fabulous, because yes. if you can give people correct information, good information, then hopefully they can make an educated decision about whether they should include something in their lifestyle. So if I was not knowing anything about beta alanine, but I was a power sport athlete, or I was looking to get an edge, I might turn into your podcast and, and watch this video and listen just to see what can it do for me? What has the research shown? What are the potential negative side effects? And how much do I need? And do I have to take it every day? Mm -hmm. You know, things like these types of questions. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, that's why I think science, and, and hopefully this does not offend any of the, uh, of your viewers and listeners or you, mm. but um, I like, for people to come at nutrition as a science. And I say this because I've had many conversations in my life, and I've probably done this myself, where I say, I don't believe in that. But with science, it's not a belief system. With science, you're supposed to look at the evidence, meaning published studies amongst the types of evidence, and you see where the preponderance is. So, so, for example, if I looked at a hundred of this last a hundred of the most recent studies on vitamin C and colds or flu, I would see how many of those studies showed an improvement in, in um, or a benefit. And if there was 
less than 50, then the preponderance of the evidence doesn't show that it's worthwhile. It's sort of a mini way of doing a meta-analysis, yeah. getting an idea. And I bring this up because the word belief. Belief is something that you, again, if it offends somebody, my apologies. Belief is something more geared for like religion, you know, whether you believe in a God or not. And, and, and however, with nutrition, it's the same thing. It's, it's a science. Our bodies ingest foods and break them down into smaller foods, into smaller chemicals, into smaller molecules, into the most basic molecules. And some of them we excrete out and some of them we keep. And the science is learning how to optimize that, learning what the body really needs, learning what benefits the body under what conditions. Like nobody would ever think that beta alanine is an antioxidant, but it has antioxidant effects. It's not a traditional antioxidant like a vitamin C or a vitamin E um, or a carotenoid, but it is an antioxidant. It has antioxidant effect because it reduces oxidative stress and that oxidative stress that accumulates in, in, in a cell causes cellular membrane disruption, which adds to cellular fatigue, which negatively impacts somebody's ability to do high energy output, what beta alanine helps you with. So there are you know, many other things to discuss. So I'm just um, uh, caffeinated and I'm, I'm happy to be on this uh, you know, uh, with you. And I, I think that um, you know, it's... The one thing I share before we move on is I often get emails or phone calls or people that approach me in either the classroom or approach me in, in let's say, one of the gyms when I'm working with some of the athletes that we work with and say, Doc, Doc, I started taking this product. What is it good for? Yeah. And so I ask them, do you always swallow a pill and then want to know what good it is or what bad it is? Like, and again, not to be rude, why are you being an idiot? Why take something? Like my rule is have a goal, have an objective, and then define how you're going to get to that goal or objective. So if you told me that you wanted to be gain weight, well, that's your objective to gain weight. And hopefully you're saying you don't want to gain fat weight. You want to gain mostly muscle weight. Then we develop a strategy that helps you gain weight, whether it's eating extra calories and moving less or whether it's changing the macronutrient ratios and adding some extra calories and changing nutrient timing, things like this. You know, there's a lot of little steps, but you have to have a strategy. So when somebody says to me, I'm taking this, I'm taking this, what is it good for? I say, what's your strategy? What are you hoping for? Why buy something if you don't know what it does for you? Yeah. Like, do you ever go to a gas station and just say, what the heck? My car doesn't take diesel, but I'm going to put diesel in my car just to see what happens. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah, exactly. You know? oh, um, I know that's off topic, but I'm very passionate about have a specific reason and a purpose for what you're doing. Yeah. Just don't do it because you saw an advertisement at a, you know, some, you know, mall or you were on some website or your local friend, you know, with that has a six pack of abs says that's what he or she does. So I, no. I, 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 I totally agree uh, with what you're what you're saying. And that's why I'm also hoping that these videos can help people make judgments and, and uh, make decisions on how they do their training, how they do their nutrition and how they do their supplementation. So a lot of a lot of myth busting as well in in this podcast. Okay, so today's topic is as you've mentioned um, beta alanine. We're going to talk a bit about beta alanine, but um, you clearly had a lot of knowledge. So before we start, could you give us a short introduction, Doug, about yourself? Yes. Um, but prior to my short introduction, we do have a plug. And this plug is for a recent book that the International Society of Sport Nutrition uh, came out with. Part of my introduction is uh, I am a co-founder or was a co-founder of the ISSN and was one of the editors of this book, Nutritional Supplements in Sport and Exercise. This book came out in the year 2015. Springer is the publisher. They publish around the world. 
It's a book that I highly recommend if you want an academic understanding of exercise nutrition and sports nutrition, along with reviews of U.S. law, EU law, and, and, and um, various dietary supplements and the studies and, and, and sports psychology as part of it, too. So thank you for that. Um, my name is Dr. Douglas Kalman. I'm a sports nutritionist and a, a professor. I teach at Florida International University. I run the sports nutrition program for our, our 18 athletic teams at the college. I also run sports nutrition for a professional mixed martial arts team known as the Black Zillions. Some of you uh, listening and watching may know if you watch any of the UFC. Some of the people like Rashad Evans, um, Vitor Belfort, um, Anthony Johnson, Stephen Struve, um, excuse me, we have worked with another a great gentleman from your area, uh, Robin Vasruslin, uh, who's a great glory fighter who's now coming over to MMA, been working with him. Matter of fact, he has a fight coming up, I believe, next week. Um, and, you know, amongst many of those others. Uh, I have been working in nutrition, um, both research and pa research, patient care, and sporting for over 20 years. Research, I started out actually in a laboratory of genetics and metabolism, doing everything on the analytical side. I had to learn how to run every different analytical device that you could think of, from HPLC to FPLC to, um, you know, all the different types of phoresis. Um, some nuclear imaging, some nuclear tracing, how to run tracer studies and all of that. That was a great experience. I also worked for a number of years in oncology or cancer. One of the things I did at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center was come up with a, a program for patients that were treated for cancer, now were done with treatment, but had changes in their body that they didn't like, they had fatigue they didn't like. And, and we came up with a program that, that actually became a book and is adopted in many different hospitals now in New York City for that. So I'm very proud of that background that I've had. And matter of fact, while I was working in oncology, I used to take care of any of the professional athletes that would come into the hospital that had cancer, whether it was a famous runner, a baseball player, a fo American football player, and, and or actor and actress, uh, anybody that was physically active. And... Probably about 16 years ago, I moved to Florida to work in a, a research laboratory and to teach at the university and to work with the athletes that I do. So I feel blessed and I, I welcome this opportunity to share um, my experience and knowledge. Wow, that was, that was that's really impressive to, to hear. So, uh, so um, hope one day I'll have as much experience as you have, uh, you have had. <laughs> Uh, I've been fortunate. I've worked five Olympics, um, three Summer Olympics, two Winter Olympics. I have the upcoming Rio Games this summer. I have track and field athletes that are in. I have track, field, tennis, swimming in, in the Summer Olympics, and um, which I feel blessed. Some of the Olympics I go to, some of them I don't. Some of the national championships I go to, some of them I don't. For example, this Friday I have a, a boxer that's fighting for a world a lightweight championship televised on American TV. I'll be there. What I do with him is help him during his last two weeks of weight cut, you know, to make weight, make sure he's doing it safely and, and on target and things like this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I'm fortunate and, and I'm happy for what I do. And that's why I feel it's our job to help give back so we can help give back both what we get as field experience along with the academic for real world application. Yeah. I tr totally agree. Okay, so um, let's dive into the questions. So first off, what is, if, if you could explain what actually beta alanine is. Okay. Beta alanine is a compound that naturally occurs in the body, naturally occurs in muscle meats, if you will. Beta alanine is part of carnosine. They are not interchangeable. We use beta alanine so we can increase muscle carnosine levels. Beta alanine becomes as a dipeptide, alanine as an amino acid, the beta pleated form, gets bond to another amino acid known as histidine. 
and then you get beta alanyl histidine, which is popularly known as carnosine. We call it beta alanine because it's probably easier. A marketer probably had the idea it's easier to say beta alanine than carnosine and nobody, whatever, something like that. But beta alanine is a naturally occurring beta version of an amino acid, alanine. And you know alanine, I know alanine as the most gluconeogenic amino acid, right? Um, and, and, and it's used in, 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 in um, many different cycles, the Cori cycle and others. But the beta form of the amino acid gets bonded to a histidine, which is another amino acid, to form a dipeptide. And that dipeptide is known as carnosine. It is your muscle levels of carnosine that directly indicate and affect your ability to have power. Not power here, but power here. And so what we need to do is we use beta alanine as a way of increasing muscle carnosine levels. There are two ways of increasing muscle carnosine levels. Exercise, well, three ways really. Exercise, supplementing with beta alanine, and being a male. Mm. Right? Men, men naturally have more carnosine than women. Probably analogous to men naturally have more muscle than women, body composition wise. Mm. However, um, again, I am a registered dietitian who has a PhD in nutritional biochemistry, research in nutritional biochemistry. And the idea is we want to increase muscle carnosine levels because the muscular level of carnosine is directly related to your ability to have power output. So interestingly enough, animals, and remember humans are animals, we're mammals, right? Animals that have the ability to have prolonged intense sprints, that's actually a power. If I ask you to go sprint a hundred meters, right? Not walk it, but sprint all out, that's power output. And that power out while you're using the phosphogen energy system and other things, blah, blah, blah. That power output is directly related to your ability for carnosine. In fact, muscle biopsy studies show that sprinters have higher carnosine levels than marathon runners. Right? Which makes sense. If you're a marathon runner, you're running all day. You're not sprinting all day. You're running at whatever six minute per mile or, you know, um, um, pace. I'm sorry for not converting that into kilometer. I'm not that fast. Yeah. Um, um, but nonetheless, you get the idea. So carnosine naturally occurs in meats. Which meat may have the highest carnosine level, you may ask? Because, heck, if I want to have more beta alanine in my body or more carnosine in my muscles, I should eat more. Well, maybe bodybuilders had it right. Chicken breast happens to be one of the highest uh, meats for carnosine. Probably because unless the chicken is cooped up, you know, they're flapping away trying to do their thing in, in a free living world. If I were to take, you know, so that's a little bit about beta alanine and carnosine. Okay, excellent. One question that I wanted to ask is, um, you said that um, to make carnosine in the muscle, you supplement with beta alanine, that is alanine and histidine together. But what if you supplemented directly with carnosine? Is that even an option to actually do? Yes. Mm -hmm. So pe people, um, there are dietary supplement companies that have or currently do sell a beta alanyl histidine, which is carnosine. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why people do not supplement with the finished carnosine versus the beta alanyl mm -hmm. histidine is that your body still has to take the carnosine. It's a dipeptide. Yeah. Leave that dipeptide mm -hmm. and then reform that dipeptide. Yeah. So if you do it beta alanine alone or the beta, yeah, the beta alanine, your body is more efficient at synthesizing carnosine. Yeah. You, save, but you save a metabolic step. I may have not explained it in a pretty way, yeah. but essentially, when you, when you take carnosine, your body has to break it down to build it back up. When you take beta, alan, beta alanine, your body does not have to break it down to build it back up. It, if, it, it, it undergoes a, a faster KM for synthesis of carnosine. Yeah, so it's basically like a lot of other stuff that gets broken down in the body and when you store it 
it gets put back together the same way. Very, very similar. Yeah. Very, definitely very similar. You know, oh. the beta alanine, if, if there's a great quote by an American football coach, which probably applies to any, any individual. And it says fatigue makes cowards of us all. Mm -hmm. In this instance, we're talking about delaying fatigue or exercise fatigue. Right, because beta alanine, as you and I will discuss and go into, helps delay fatigue, muscular fatigue, and muscular fatigue occurs for many different reasons. But if somebody's asking me, Doctor Doug, why would I want to take beta alanine? Somebody actually asked me that yesterday when I was over at at, at Jocko Hybrid Training Center where the Black Zillions train. Yeah. One of the Bellator fighters, this gentleman named Michael Chandler who fights for a championship uh, June 24th, I believe it is. He's asked me, Dr. Doug, why would I take beta alanine? And he's a very smart guy. So I was explaining to him that the goal is to delay fatigue when, you're in a, when you are in certain sports that are high energy output sports, whether it's repeated sprints, whether it's repeated kicking, whether it's repeated anything, except for maybe playing chess. All right. Um, your whole goal is to delay fatigue, because if you delay fatigue, then you're also able to improve your energy output or exercise capacity. And you're also able to. Through training, be able to handle a greater a greater training load, which allows your body to have greater adaptation, adaption to the training stress, which makes you better prepared for the event that you're training for. I explained it much nicer to him yesterday, but that's essentially what I uh, share with today. Yeah, excellent. So, please go ahead. But what 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 type like before we got uh, go deeper into the question? I have a follow up question. Uh, there's a lot of research that that have shown that beta alanine has a performance benefit. What type of sports has it actually shown to have a good benefit? What type of sports? Do supplementing with beta alanine have an advantage? You know, it's interesting. Sometimes in research, we bring people to the physiology lab and we put them on a bicycle or we put them on a treadmill and we have them do something that's called wind gates. Yeah. And um, a wind gate, for example, if you don't know out there what a wind gate is, it was named obviously for the Wingate Institute in, 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 in Israel, in Herzliya, if I recall correctly. Um, but nonetheless, a Wingate is a type of a test that tests your anaerobic power. The e th there are many different ways of doing a Wingate, but let's just play together as this way. Let's say I put you on the Monarch bike. You're pedaling against no resistance, normal pedaling. You, I, I let you warm up for a minute or two that way. Then you're going to do 30 second sprints on the bike. But when you do these 30 second sprints, when we say go, we drop a resistance. So now instead of pedaling against no resistance, you're pedaling against about 75% of your body weight. Uh, up to, it depends. Every different wind gate you could do different. You could do a seven and a half kilo load that they do resistance against. So let's say that we're doing that. The idea is to see how many watts of energy you could put out in repeated motions over 30 seconds of hard work and then you get a break and then you repeat it and then you do it. So some of the studies that we do in a, in a physiology lab are not specific, oh, today we're going to test judokas, you know, people that do judo, or we're going to test football slash soccer players. We might take a football soccer player and put them on the bike because that bike is testing their ability to do anaerobic work mm -hmm. or anaerobic work capacity, which translates back to their sport. As you and I were joking around and talking earlier about the beautiful game of football slash soccer, some of the positions you are sprinting, 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 and then you're not doing, then you're just covering some field space. So maybe a, the idea is to take what we do in the in the in the research gym, research lab, and translate it for the athlete. We've done studies in soccer players, we've done studies in swimmers, we've done studies in boxers, we've done studies in judokas, 
We've done studies in American football players. We've done studies with triathletes. We've done studies with sprinters. And there's a whole host of others. And of course, we've done them in men and we've done them in women. Men and women are not the same um, uh, metabolically. So how a man might react to a drug or a dietary supplement might be different than a woman. And I use the word drug in there because metabolism is metabolism. So you and I as men, let's say that we are known to metabolize aspirin in a certain way. Women may have a, the same pathway, but it may occur differently time-wise. So we do know that in general, women have lower levels of muscle carnosine and men have more. And that interestingly enough, for any of you weightlifters out there, out of the general population, bodybuilders have been found to have the highest levels of muscle carnosine. Probably, especially those bodybuilders that squat mm -hmm. and, and do real work, not the ones that do like five repetitions and then get off the bench and read their latest iMessage and then go on Facebook and then sit back, but the people that go to the gym to work. And so... That's an example of exercise increasing carnosine levels and a type of a sport where having higher carnosine levels would give you better benefit. Yeah, if you have that type of training, because it's, it's more likely that they have higher um, levels of carnosine because they do high repetitions than uh, what's, what's, if you compare it, for example, to a powerlifter or a weightlifter, for example. But uh, you also mentioned something else with the bodybuilders, the, the chicken, the intake of chicken. So a combination maybe of those two, or uh, what do you think? I would say maybe, you know, yes, the diet does play a, a point, but we do know definitively people that engage in power sports. Mm -hmm. And again, power doesn't necessarily mean that you're yelling from the top of a mountain. It just means it's an explosive movement. And it's for a short duration. Yeah. So again, I would argue that a power a, a sprinter is also a power sport. Mm -hmm. In American football, you might say the football linemen, the guys that block for the running backs, yeah. they have to get up out of their stance and explode for six to ten seconds at a time. That's a power sport. And they have to do it repeatedly, sometimes 60 or 80 times in a game or more. Yeah. Same thing on the defensive side. The defensive line is exploding up and going forward. So, yeah, these are all of these different things for sure. Excellent. So how would you, like, how would you supplement with, with, uh, with beta alanine? Is it similar to uh, creatine monohydrate that you have to do... Uh, loading phase and then you can go over to a, a lower dosage that you can use does it work acutely um, do you chronically have to use it these are all great questions and it seems universally from the research literature the total dosage per day of beta alanine to induce a positive benefit appears to be about six and a half grams per day or 6.4 grams. So anywhere from six to six and a half grams total of beta alanine per day. Typically beta alanine in research and in real world is broken up into two doses. And those two doses are usually about a half of a teaspoon, which is about two and a half to three grams. A teaspoon generally holds five grams. So if, if you don't have something that's exactly a three gram scoop or a three gram pill, it's about a half of a teaspoon. And, and traditionally, this is taken, you know, 30 to 60 minutes prior to the workout. And the second dose is taken after the workout. Some people will take the beta alanine, mix it with creatine and put it in their post-exercise protein or their post-exercise protein carbohydrate drink. <coughs> Excuse me. Beta alanine generally comes in capsule form and powder form. I've not really seen it in other forms, but generally, um, uh, and food form too. We all eat chicken and we eat meat and we eat fish and that all has beta alanine too. But, you know, what happens is when you ingest carnosine, there's an enzyme 
that circulates that's known as carnet uh, carnosinase that breaks it down into the individual beta alanine and histidine. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, like we said earlier, it's got to be resynthesized. So those are the forms that it's typically taken. Again, let's for the take home, the dosage typically used is about three grams pre-workout or pre-training and another three grams after training. I will tell you, and this part of my our conversation is not necessarily backed by science, but I, I have also observed athletes who use beta alanine consistently around the three gram dose only pre-workout or only pre-training, but consistently almost every day and don't take that second dose after they're done training yet still have benefit. Yeah. So, um, cause the half life, meaning it clears out of your body very fast. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why people, take the extra beta alanine is so they can, that they can help increase circulating carnosine levels, beta alanine levels, and hopefully muscle carnosine levels. So again, it's usually three grams before and after, and I've seen people uh, have benefit at just three grams before. Okay, excellent. But do you, have, do you have to take it before and after training, or could you take it for, um, for breakfast, for example? Do you ha like do you have an acute effect on your training session when you take it before your workout, or does it take time to actually build up in your system? That's a good question, and there honestly there has not been a lot of literature, meaning research, looking at does does dose timing of beta alanine make a difference? Meaning, uh, comparatively, there's been studies that have looked at that if you supplement with creatine either be right before you work out or after you work out or before you go to bed, is there a difference in, in your muscle creatine uptake and in creatine levels and in, in body composition? And yes, there is. Yeah. As compared, And beta alanine, we simply don't know. There's not been research that says, well, if I just take it with breakfast at 6 a.m. when I have breakfast, but yet I'm not training to 4 p.m., will it benefit me? Yeah. I would argue it probably would not benefit you because it's, metabolically cleared out of the body pretty fast. I would argue that the better benefit is usually having it within an hour prior to starting the actual exercise. This way you have higher, you'll actually have higher serum concentrations. You'll have higher ability or greater likelihood of getting the favorable metabolic reactions, meaning controlling intracellular pH, because that's sort of the goal of beta alanine. Okay. What about uh, beta alanine having a synergistic effect with other supplements? Is there any research on that topic? For example, combining beta alanine with creatine monohydrate, do you see a big, bigger benefit supplement, supplementing the two together compared to only using one of them? Oh, no. There, there's definitive research that shows that beta alanine and creatine together have synergy on body composition and exercise performance. There was um, probably one of the landmark studies, if you will, meaning a, a, a very good study that was the first one to show with really clear data and good statistics, a benefit of creatine and beta alanine put together. I believe it was Dr. Jay Hoffman, who's now at the University of Central Florida, but when he was teaching at um, um, the College of New Jersey, I believe it was, he did a study looking at football players, American football players, where they had one group that got placebo, one group that got creatine, one group that got beta alanine, and one group that got creatine beta alanine mixed together. So then that's testing every different type of variability. And what did they find? They basically concluded that those people that supplemented with creatine and beta alanine had enhanced potential for the submax exercise performance, okay, and as well on their lactate threshold. So that means that they were actually able to do more anaerobic work before having to be able to stop. So that was on the performance stand stand uh, point. Interestingly enough, that those people that also had the, the creatine and beta alanine mixed together had a positive effect on body composition, meaning greater loss of body fat for some reason with beta alanine and creatine mixed together than either alone. It possibly could be that if you're taking a supplement and you're actually working as hard as you're supposed to, and that supplement is supposed to help you to be able to work harder, longer, 
that the reason for the positive impact on body composition greater than creatine alone or beta alanine alone was that you were able to do more work. So if I'm able to do more work, I'm able to oxidize more ATPs, I'm able to oxidize or beta oxidize more fat and burn more calories. So it sort of made sense to me. But again, what was really impressive was that also with the beta alanine and creatine, that the significant increase in upper body strength and lower body strength was better for those two combined than separate. Okay, interesting. So, so if I'm if I'm an athlete that's that that is looking to gain some muscle, looking to lose a little fat, and also looking to have a higher metabolic output and have high energy for my soccer game slash football, for my MMA fight, um, you know, for if I'm doing other sports and we'll get where these supplements play a part in other sports, you know, that's something that I'm interested in. If I could just go for one other second on a different topic for a second. Yeah. It used to be that creatine was only for people involved in anaerobic sports, right? Mm -hmm. People mostly it used to be that creatine was only used by weightlifters for the predominant part. And then research started looking at different athletes that do sports that have an aerobic segment and an anaerobic segment. And why would it matter? And I'll give you an example. There's been some real good data, some decent studies that have looked at marathon runners mm -hmm. and creatine supplementation. And generally, since creatine is um, used to help replete you know, uh, ATP, the, 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 the phosphate groups that are used when you go from ATP to ADP to AMP, you have to rephosphorylate. So that phosphate comes from somewhere. It comes from phosphocreatine. So when you creatine supplement, you help slightly increase your stores of that. So you get higher turnover or faster turnover. Found, now going back to the studies, found that the benefit to the marathon runners occurred when they had to do or occurred over the sprint that they do at the end of the race which is totally anaerobic. I've ran 26 miles and now I see the finish line because I'm 0.1 miles away. Sorry for not doing it in metric that I'm able to sprint all out. And they've even seen the same thing with other similar types of sports where you, where you, where you do interval. And even a, like I've run, I've run about 15 marathons myself, full marathons, and I've run, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. I've run eight full marathons and 15 half marathons. Yeah. And one of the ways that I learned to lower my marathon running time was sort of to run in intervals. I would run harder, faster for a time period, and then I would cut back a little bit. Run harder, faster for a time period, then I would cut back. I honestly actually cut off, cut out slightly cut down slightly uh, a little under an hour off of my marathon time by, by doing interval training for my marathon and, and interval running throughout the whole marathon. Wow. And my point was, what would help with those intervals? My ability to have high energy. Beta alanine, this comes back to beta alanine. It's good. Beta alanine's major role is to lower or to fight the local acidification that occurs in your muscles. When you exercise at a high intensity, whether it's 20 repetitions on the bench press, whether it's a 30 punch comp combination over 12 seconds, or whether it's 10 kicks, or you're just repeatedly doing a lot of soccer kicks, you're practicing your corner kicks, and you're going kick, 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 kick. Your ability to produce that energy repeatedly is greatly impacted by the pH level of what's happening inside your cells. We have all heard of metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis, things that you don't want to be in, things that end you up in an ICU unit in a hospital. But when you exercise, you also get local muscular acidosis. And that's when the, the accumulation of ions and the accumulations of organic acids, including lactic acid, accumulate so much intracellular that it disrupts your body's ability to do another repetition, to form another contraction. And this is why you can't, we don't have the same high energy output over time. Beta alanine actually helps slow the accumulation of all of those acids and ions, delaying fatigue, allowing you to maintain that higher energy output. And when you have higher levels of carnosine in your body and beta alanine, you're ability to repeat that high energy output 
is there. Hopefully that didn't go too off course. And, no, and no, no. That was that was that was excellent. It's great that you um, explain more deeply so people actually understand what's what's uh, what's going on. Uh, a common a common side effect from um, from beta alanine, if you take a high enough dosage, is that you feel a tingling sensation, some some itching sensation in the skin. Um, could you? Explain a bit about what's what's actually happening in the body when you supplement with beta alanine and experience this this effect. And is it is it uh, is it dangerous? Great question. Um, so for those of you that do not understand what we're talking about, beta alanine can cause is what's known as a vasodilator. That means it helps open up your blood vessels. And it's not that it's opening up your blood vessels in your carotid artery. It's helping to opening open them up in your periphery. And your periphery, if you need it explained to you, will be your extremities, your hands, your feet, your elbows, your knees, your ear, things that don't get a lot of blood flow going through them. So if I vasodilate, I'm not only opening up the area to more blood coming in, but also what's inside that blood, oxygen, beta alanine, and a few other things. And it's well known that vasodilation can cause tingling, a tingling sensation, a burning sensation, and or an itching sensation. And so if any of you out there have ever taken the B vitamin nicotinic acid, which is one of the two forms of niacin, Nicotinic acid does this same effect, but very in a stronger way, faster, stronger, harder, longer. So beta alanine, one of the potential side effects when you take beta alanine on an empty stomach, or even if you take it with food and taking it either way does not hamper its ability to be absorbed. Taking it with food reduces the chances that you will, will experience a paresia. And paresia is just basically you get a little bit of burning, a little bit of stinging, stinging and a little bit of tingling in your periphery. It, it's not harmful. It feels weird, but it's not harmful. You may even turn red and get flushed. Somebody might come to you and ask you, did you put on new makeup? And the answer is, it goes away after about 15 or 20 minutes. It's uncomfortable. You get used to it. And actually, over time, your body attenuates that response, meaning that you become more tolerant. It doesn't bother you as much. And what I say to people is one way that you can tell, it's not foolproof, but one way that you could tell that you're getting the actual product that you're buying, besides that you are assuming to trust the people that you buy products from, is that if you do experience the tingling, the sensation, the changes that occur after within 15, 20 minutes of the beta alanine, you know that your body's absorbed it. Because that, that is a sign that it's actually having a metabolic and a physiologic effect. But how about the tolerance between different individuals? Because I know, for example, I can't... If I take a 3 gram dosage of beta alanine, I experience some GI discomfort from taking that. Because I know that's one of the other side effects with it. So I find it better to actually split up the dosage in in four doses during the day so 1.5 and i take that four times would you say that is uh, less optimal compared to taking three grams two times a day um, i don't know if it's less optimal you have to do what works for you mm -hmm. and and i i say that that um there are studies there are studies that have shown beta alanine to have a benefit when broken up into three doses spaced throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And there are studies that have shown benefit for a beta alanine taken two doses per day. So I, I think it's more it has more to do with that you're getting exogenous, extra exogenous beta alanine in your body versus the total singular dose. Yeah. So people doing it, like there was one study where they gave, I think it was one and a half grams of beta alanine three times a day. So that's about a four and a half gram total dose. They did see some benefit, but my point is that they used three doses per day. There's another study that was done by Stout where they also used three, three doses throughout the day. 
So again, the idea is optimally you're using at least your first dose or a dose centered around the time that you're exercising. Mm -hmm. And then the other doses don't really matter as long as you're getting it in. Okay, excellent. Is there, is there any difference between um, brands on how slow it actually releases in the system? So you will, would avoid getting the, the side effect that we talked about? Well, we'll always have some side effects. But one of the things that you said, and, and again, if I repeat this wrong, my apologies, is that some people experience uh, gastrointestinal side effects, GI side effects. Mm -hmm. um, I personally have never have, and I've never seen any athlete that I've worked with using beta alanine have a GI side effect. Mm -hmm. I have heard of that with creatine, especially when somebody was taking creatine mixed with a lot of sugar, yeah. as creatine used to be sold. Mm -hmm. Remember, creatine, people used to be told to take their you know, creatine mixed with something like 75 or 80 grams of sugar at a time. Yeah. You know, crazy. It's great for diabetes. Um, yeah. So, but that being said, um, one way that you, also one way that you minimize gastric side effects is by having it with food. Yeah. Um, for example, I would not mix beta alanine in coffee. Coffee is already acidic. Mm -hmm. And if beta alanine, uh, if you have a GI side effect, it's going to only exacerbate it. For me, it doesn't matter. I can do it. I have an iron stomach. Yeah. That, but on an individual basis, you have to find what works for you. Research tells us group-wise what works. Then you sort of have to tweak it for the timing that works for you. Yeah. That's, uh, that's great advice. Okay, Doug. Um... I want to thank you so much for sorry, taking... I'm yeah. sorry, Duma, if you don't mind. You asked me a very important question before yeah. and that I wanted to go over. You said, what sports has beta alanine been used in or tested in? And I, I gave you analogies of what we do in a research lab to some yeah. that play over with some sports. Yeah. But I also like as a nutrition, I consider myself a coach. Yeah. I, I coach people how to eat for what they're going to do and eat for performance and eat for a goal. And part of it is that if you understand the metabolic pathways or the, the biochemistry of how something occurs in the body or the pathway, then you could see what sport it applies to. So, for example, you and I mentioned what we call soccer in America, football, the rest of the world, American football as well. But there's also hockey. There's also basketball. Why? Those are stop and go sports. Stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. That's all explosive. You know, the, in general, and I don't think it's really changed, when you look at team sports um, and you look at sports, you even have skiers. You even have you know, some of those skiers that do multiple runs. Um, I go back to hockey because hockey players are known to have the highest VO2 of any, of a, any team sport. But, and why? Because they basically do intervals. They have two-minute shifts, usually on the ice. It's two minutes of skating, two minutes of rest. Two minutes of skating, two minutes of rest. So um, those people that do cycling, those people that do rowing, one, uh, Dr. Jose Antonio, the CEO of the International Society of Sports Nutrition, is very into paddleboard races, stand-up paddleboard. Yeah. Well, his, his, he actually challenged a bunch of us to join him in a 12-mile paddleboard race. Um, so... So that's, you know, 12, that's 20 kilometers. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of power you have to output to cover 20 kilometers. Beta alanine would have some benefit for part of that. Yeah. Creatine would have some benefit for part of that. Water and food would have some great benefit for part of that. So I wanted to really share with you that for our listeners and, and people watching, beta alanine not will only be able to help you do more in a gym, but the also helps you to get to your goal and the understanding is have a goal and then have a strategy to get there yeah excellent uh, one thing that I also wanted to mention is that um, I've looked actually I've heard some uh, speakers that have actually worked with a couple of soccer teams in in uh, in England so they work with with the Premier League soccer players and uh, I was actually surprised when they mentioned that the type of supplements that I actually use is creatine, uh, caffeine, beta-alanine, 
uh, and they also use like carbohydrates and protein powders as well. But okay. one one of them that I was surprised about was actually the extensive use of uh, of beta alanine in in uh, in those sports because typically when when people talk about beta alanine, it's been geared towards more like combat sports. That's what people are familiar with. Right. And uh, like uh, short distance or uh, middle distance runners, like 400 meters or 800 meters. But I can see the, the benefits, like you mentioned, in, in those type of sports, especially ice hockey. How many minutes do you actually stay on the ice when you play ice hockey? It's around four, 14 minutes total or 16 minutes total during a game. It, it depends upon which line you're which line you're in, but mm. it, it can be as it can be twenty four yeah. minutes. Or so. mm. um, the other thing I wanted to mention to you, because there might be one of these in in your audience, mm. is the people with the lowest levels of muscle carnosine naturally walking around mm. are vegetarians and vegans. Yeah. So if you are a vegan athlete and you want to be a power athlete. Or if you're a vegetarian and you want to be a vegetarian bodybuilder, you are already walking around with lower muscle carnosine levels and lower creatine levels. Yeah. But vegans and vegetarians actually respond the best to, to beta alanine as well as to creatine as compared to meat eaters. Yeah. You know, so it, it's something to, to take uh, to, to not forget, you know? Absolutely. That's a, that's a great point. I think they actually do... Um, because some of the studies, when you look at, for example, creatine, they they make a make a deal of actually mentioning that the, none of the participants were actually vegetarians or vegans because they know that they usually have the highest effects when they supplement with creatine. It's very, very, very true. And again, yeah. I'm I'm also looking at some data while we're talking here that shows as little as 3.2 grams, or let's just round it to three. Mm. So it was three grams a day, just taken once a day. Mm. will increase muscle carnosine levels by almost 65% alone. Yeah. If double the dosage and took it twice a day, it increases muscle carnosine by about 80%. So you're only about 20% more than just taking it once per day. So even if you're only taking the, the carnosine beta alanine once per day, you are still getting benefit. And even if you're only doing that 3, 3.2 gram dose, you don't need a heck of a lot. And it's an underappreciated dietary supplement for sport performance. Absolutely. All right, Doug. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do this great podcast on beta alanine. Um, where can people find more information about what, who you are and, and what you do? Well, thank you. Um, well, first, I would like to invite the audience to go to the website, www.vissn.org which is the International Society of Sports Nutrition's website. On that website, you, you'll see um, various pull-down menus, and amongst the, the, the pull-downs, if you will, are conferences. And the ISSN puts on joint conferences and, and solo conferences around the world. We just had one in London. We have another one coming up, I believe, in Ireland. We have one next week in Clearwater, Florida, the annual conference, where we have people coming from 50 different nations, which is awesome. And uh, again, um, there's other materials there. There's also the journal, JISSN.com, which is a, a National Library of Medicine indexed journal. That's it's the only journal in the National Library of Medicine that's dedicated solely to sports nutrition. There are other journals that cover aspects of sports nutrition. This is the only indexed highest impact factor journal only on sports nutrition. And so, and it's free. Um, um, to read. Um, so I ask people to go there. And then a little bit about me more. If you're interested in the mixed martial arts world, you can see blackzillions.com for, for the MMA team that I work for. Excellent. And I, I have to thank you for the time and, and thank you for helping me enjoy again what it is that we do, translating science to useful information that can help another person get to their goal. Excellent, Doug. Uh, thank you so much. Once again, thank you so much for, for taking the time after, after, out of your busy schedule to do this podcast. And I hope people find uh, this podcast as enjoyable as I have done today. Right, thank you again so much. Okay. Have a nice day, Doug, and talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.